Hey, Storm Watchers, how's it been? It's me, Akachan, no Tatsumaki, like always, and it has been a long time since I've been back on this platform, and due to an unfortunate bug that has been going around to the point where my whole school is locked down, I am able to spend more time and to doing what I like, which is this YouTube, which is my YouTube career. Uh, pretty much, this will be a overview of Castlevania Season 3, of what I've promised to multiple people who've been to my channel here and there, commenting uh, this and that and, what, and whatnot. Uh, especially boy uh, reviews. If if I'm getting his name right, I, I'm sorry. I'll post this. Uh, I'll post uh, his channel up above. Uh, but yeah, pretty much he re he asked if I was going to review anything, and I gave him the latest news of what I've been up to. Cause pretty much I'm currently not really accessing any of my any of my uh, social media uh, posts for reasons I will not explain and pretty much that's literally just the gist of what I've, what's been going on lately of why uh, I now have time to do this review and YouTube in general. Um, Castlevania Season 3 can be summed up in a few words you can say uh fillerish maybe one of them not exactly it's one of them but it's definitely somewhere right there i could say uh, especially with uh, uh uh with trevor and cypher's little subplot story going on uh so and uh especially with alucard i guess you can say that's where that's where the 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 fillerish aspects of the show are at in terms of a narrative uh, perspective, uh, this show, by account, literally has about four, and I may be wrong, but I actually enlist them, four, like, subplots going on at a time. You got uh, Hector being tormented by, uh, being tormented by Carmilla and her, and her cohorts, and you got Sypha and Trevor pretty much defending Wallachi. Uh, I know I pronounced it wrong, and you got uh, you got Isaac pretty much doing whatever. Apparently, he's in the Middle East. He's trying to get back to Romania to more or less do whatever he needs to do with Dracula. Uh, and we pretty much got our card uh, more or less being welcomed by. These uh, two twin Japanese uh, kids who want to more or less learn uh, uh, magic to defend our homeland. Uh, so pretty much in terms of narrative, there's like yeah, just there's a, like a lot of subplots going on, so to speak. Um, and for their own, they kind of all do stand up on their own. And they're all kind of interesting. And in terms of even dialogue, I think pretty much Trevor and uh, Trevor and uh, Trevor and Cipher pretty much steal the show in terms of this. I just like their more or less back and forth banter they got with each other. It almost seems like a how like a real relationship is in real life. Like at first it's kind of bumpy, and in the middle it's kind of bumpy, and then at the end it kind of makes up for the end. But yeah, pretty much I like more or less how I like their pretty much their banter, their interactions, pretty much. In terms of, you know, their jargon, it seems reasonable enough. We have some really funny one liners from Trevor, especially and Cypher, pretty much always being the, the the side shit talker. We pretty much get some good banter from her too. The more sarcastic, dry, more or less humor we usually get from her, uh, according from the last two seasons of uh, Castlevania. So, yeah, pretty much in terms of uh, character interactions, especially with those two, and in terms of jargon and her dialogue, it's pretty, pretty, it's pretty solid. God, what's going on? I'm saying things twice today. 
Uh, anyway, yeah, pretty much I like their banter and their interactions seem reasonable enough and whatnot. Uh, Alucard is Alucard. He's pretty much bait for the fangirls. <laughs> it's, I mean, I like Alucard. I like, I like all three of those characters. I like their... More or less, I like their, their their triad, so to speak, and they all even work on their own for the most part. Uh, but admittedly, yeah, Alucard is pretty much just uh, bait for fangirls. But I feel like if I would if I would have pick out if if I would have like if you would have put a blindfold on me and tell me which one I would pick out. Uh, randomly, his would still come up as being actually kind of the most uh, fragile of most of the subplots because nothing really happens. And yes, that same argument can be said for uh, Cypher and Trevor, but his in particular was literally like stationary, the most stationary. And honestly, not really the most interesting. I mean, it was uh, just as I said, it was just as cut and dry as I, as I mentioned it. Is These two Japanese kids... It come to learn magic and skills from him to protect our country, protect our clan and whatnot from vampires and what else. And that's literally just about it. Somewhere they have a threesome with him despite being siblings. But the whole time it was a trap. Yeah, I get into spoilers, but you should have already known that by now. Uh they ca- they kind of snare him with this kind of binding spell or instrument of somehow, and then he turns the tables on him, and he, I guess the only real fitting part of it where he kills them both, he more or less impels them on a, a wooden pikes and leave them outside his cat his castle. Which I guess is pretty fitting. I guess with with that concept alone, they're trying to say uh, the apple doesn't fall so far from the tree, like son, like father. And that's what his father did. He impaled people on spikes, and he was just some grouchy, dark weirdo living in a castle by himself. So I guess that's the whole main concept of them. Like those two characters were were put there and they were built up just to show pretty much how really alone, how really you know solitary of a, how much of a solitary person uh, uh, Alucard is as a person and in terms of you know attitude and personality and and I guess from a certain extent in few in, in terms of moralities they're actually pretty similar I mean I guess that was the whole point of why they were set up just to more or less be execution and pay off when they kind of backstab them and and he kills them and whatnot. Uh, I guess that was the whole point of their of hi, of that subplot. But I just felt like it was just a bit bland. Like you could have just blinked and and totally missed it. Like it didn't really tribute anything to the season. And honestly, it was kind of the, like again, it was kind of the weakest. It it bared any real interest or or or, or relevance to anything else going on. Uh, that yeah, that subplot was pretty much just made to. Dwell in more into Alucard's character, his personality, who he is. Um, in terms of music, it's pretty much as stellar. In terms of the score, it's pretty much as stellar, and it's pretty much just as lively and even kind of gothic as po- as as ever and whatnot. It uh really, you know, it really is immersive. It really puts you in this really mystical demon vampiric written world of Castlevania that we know it so the music pretty much in terms of uh, exerting uh, uh, immersion into the world or into the battles or what's going on it pretty much done right on that aspect so pretty much the score pretty much gets a or pretty much gets a uh, uh, it's pretty, pretty good damn what <laughs> Where's my jargon today? It's not in my hand. It's not on this table. It's not in this mic. <laughs> it's not on the floor. Uh, I guess it's in my ass then. Uh, pause. But yeah, I guess it's in my ass um, today. Uh, but yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much the score. Pretty much, Lily does uh, set up the world and the tone and. It pretty much does help uh, uh, illustrate 
the emotion of what's going on at certain parts. Like at times it seems really laggy and straggy and kind of like want and, and kind of like, you know, drifting and especially during the time when Cypher and Trevor has, uh, has a, a banter between each other, which I guess is th- that illustrates, you know, the more laid back and more comedic and humorous, like, you know, uh, aura going on. There can be really, really intense and dramatic and soul caliber esque when they fighting with that really popular thing that won't get out of my head. Uh, so yeah, in terms of score development, it's good. It even has somber uh, sounds to illustrate, you know, the the desperation of the characters or the uh, how really you know really anguish filled like the 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 overall scenarios could be at times. So yeah, uh, keep up on the score; it's pretty good, uh, and I'm impressed. Uh, Art style animation is, you know, pretty much exceptional. Yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. Exceptional uh, as ever, pretty much. It's uh, glossy at times where it needs to be to show, you know, the light uh, bouncing and hitting off of them. Uh, They don't look extremely anime-ish. It's kind of got this, it adopts this more, uh, this more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? And what era comic books? This more uh, 90s-ish. 90s-ish entering 2000-ish uh, uh, type of Western comic book art style to it. It's really gothic, uh, 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 grim-looking style as they chose uh, for the most part. Um, yeah, so in terms of animation, it's great. At times, it can look like almost especially like towards the last episode where it literally almost looked like it came straight out of the original concept uh, art of the guy who uh, always drew the uh, PlayStation 2 era Castlevania games. Like it at times looked like as good as that, as detailed, as glossy, as goth, that tip, that really gothic aspect we like of it. So yeah, the art is pretty good. Animation at times, yeah, it's also great. Although I think they can do more uh, hand drawn and less CGI, but yeah, it's pretty good at times because uh, the CGI looks like garbage <laughs> in this at times. Like it kind of looks like Ajin. It's like it's like it's like the people decided to put Ajin characters in <laughs> something really really animated. What I could think of, they put Ajin characters in. It's almost, it's, it looks at times the CJ looks like they put Ajin characters in the first season of uh, the Legend of Korra, and it just doesn't mash well at all. And at times it just seems really, really obvious that this is CGI, and it just doesn't clash well at all. Uh, or I suggest they pretty much should have used more animation. But I think, of course, they put, um, they always usually use uh, CGI to illustrate, you know, the importance of the object or the subject that's at motion. But it could have just looked so much better than that, uh, better than those sequences for the most part. Uh, So, yeah, in the art department, it's pretty much great and it's glossy and it's well detailed and illustrated. And the gothic atmosphere to the characters really actually, again, really helps establish the tone and and the feel of the show that's going on for the most part. God, it's hot in here. Uh, uh, pretty much, if I, if I were to say which would be actually the best, the best subplot, uh, it would literally have to be, I guess, around. It has to be around Isaac or uh, Siphon and Trevor uh, themselves, I guess. That uh, with the third best actually being uh, being uh, Hector's imprisonment. Um, so yeah, <laughs> um, 
Trevor, uh, pretty much a Trevor and, and, and Cypher uh, subplot literally consists of them more or less trying to make ends meet for the most part, trying to get cash in their pockets from what and whatnot, and pretty much keeping uh, parts of Romania safe from uh, demonic and uh, vampiric presence, pretty much. And from pretty much their misadventures, they get to this specific town where they ent- where they uh, meet some occultists who are humans who praise Dracula and believe that his uh or and believe that his that his evil is law, so to speak. Uh, hate to uh, the uh, the uh, mention Aku, but yeah, there's a cultist of humans who believe uh, Dracula's uh, uh, evil was law. And they wish on more or less obtaining ways such as philosophy to resurrect the fallen Dark Lord to more or less reestablish his monarchy over uh, Romania and eventually over the world. And pretty much uh, Cypher and Trevor are hired by the town's priest and and, uh, minister to pretty much uh, find out what's going on with the cult and what exactly they're planning, and pretty much that their whole subplot pretty much amounts to again setting up things for future uh, uh, arcs and story or uh, story arcs and uh, narrative uh, points. Um, uh, for this uh, series future, which I'm bound is most likely going to be the case, because season three has has been getting some pretty good uh, uh, reception lately. So I got a, ch- I got I, I got a, a, a itching that we're going to see more of Netflix Castlevania in the future. Uh, so yeah, and pretty much the ver- the when they revealed that. The Dracula cult pretty much opened literally another dimension that revealed uh, Dracula and Lisa uh, cuddling with each other in the midst of this hellish realm of chaos. We can pretty much, it can, that's pretty much inferred that uh, there's future, or there's future plans in future uh, arcs and even subplots in the future for uh, this series. Uh, so pretty much long story short, they uh, beat the cult. They stopped him from trying to, you know, do whatever they were trying to doing, like releasing demons on the earth. Uh, and pretty much they, it's also revealed that the uh, priest was actually a scumbag and literally pretty much killed children with this booby trap in the woods. And he even killed the cultists, and pretty much they burned down his house, so no one could know of what's going on. But that's slowly that more or less illustrates that people are going to have to go through any measures necessary, even if the most vile and grievous, to assure that where of what of the the township that they're occupying is safe and secure. Secu- sec- secured, <laughs> hot. Uh, that's that's that that's that's the slang talking, y'all. That that's that's my slang talking. Uh, secured from any Dracula influences and demonic presences, uh, presence, uh, for the most part. And pretty much from there ends off with them, more or less, going to the next town to or in the next vill- village to um more or less defend people from demons and whatnot. And pretty much that literally ends uh, Trevor and Cypher's, uh, that pretty much ends Trevor and Cypher's subplot in the story. Uh, and now if, from actually thinking it, it will actually have to be the second best with, I, with, uh, with Isaac's actually being probably first. Because, yeah, although despite most of his dialogue is 
fuck humans, fuck them, fuck the humans. They are nothing, they are trash. For the thunder, ah. But for the most part, despite of his little hate human speech, uh, more or less uh, banter here and there and, 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 and uh, rants that we hear throughout the series. He, uh, you know, for the most part, again, just like uh, a la carte, it was made to set up more about his personality, uh, dwell in more to his reasoning of things. Uh, the fact that he even Lily at one point had to do truces with the same people he despised was kind of pretty much fitting and kind of poetic and and. Had a lot of irony to it, and well, if it went, if, well, if, of course, you know, there are people who play Castlevania knows that Isaac still plans on resurrecting Dracula and killing all humans, so we know that won't actually happen. But in this nef- in in this series case, he might actually have a more or less a transition, a redemption arc, so to speak, to coming back to being human, having. You know, those senses again, the like, yeah, Dracula's kind of, you know, not good because he's actually actually the real monster and whatnot. But, you know, you you never know. There could be a change in the story. Hell, uh, Castlevania itself has been literally rewritten like over five times by now. So, yeah, you never know. Uh, But, yeah, pretty much on that aspect. Um, and pretty much, yeah, his is summed up with, it's just a pretty much character development, character, uh, explanation. We dwell more in, uh, Isaac as a character. That's pretty much just like, uh, just like Alucard's, it was pretty much made to establish him as a character. Uh, and, and in turn, in the last subplot, it goes to goes to Hector goes to Hector being a captive of uh, Carmelia in her, her in cohorts and pretty much literally throughout his whole little subplot we just see him more or less get kicked in his teeth and smacked around by uh, by at least like by at least like two or more of the the vampiric sisterhood so to speak as they say. Uh, and the whole time you actually may think you know like like this the, like Hector's subplot in general at times it make you think like oh man someone needs to save this man like you know the little vampire shawty gave him some uh, some bush and he, and she was kept puckering him up to escape because you made it made it almost look like you know they kind of fell in love and at one point for Hector he kind of almost thought it was real until no, we just realized the bitch was just more or less using him to bind a spell to him that will allow him, that will allow all the demons he summoned to be under the control of the vampire sisters. Cause it, I'm not trying to get all Lori because everyone knows about Castlevania, or for those who don't, of course that's why I'm explaining it. Forge Masters pretty much are uh, sorcerers who pretty much. Literally resurrect the dead by uh, resurrect the dead resurrect resurrect the dead by instilling demon souls into them from hell, and pretty much everything you know he forged masters, <coughs> if you please, more or less falls under his control. So the vampire chick who gave him some bush. Pretty much uh, came up with this genius idea from her vampiric studies to more or less uh, have this binding enchantment that will allow her and her sister's control over any demon he uh, 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 summons. And that, again, also just establishes uh, that, uh, 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 sub- that subplot pretty much, again, also establishes and builds upon, you know, future uh, sub-arcs and narrative stories of Castlevania, just like uh, the others. And obviously, we will pretty much, give or take, see a redemption arc from uh, Hector as a ca- Hector as a character. Uh, so, yeah, there's that for the most part. Um, 
in terms of narrative, like in general of all four, uh, pretty much, pretty much, I feel like uh, it could be a bit clusterfuckerish at times. <laughs> Man, I need to write a fucking lexicon. All the shit I'd be saying, but yeah. Uh, it can be a bit clusterfuckish at sometimes, and even disappointing, and literally kind of predictable at times. Cause, cause uh, you couldn't have been a rocket scientist to realize that, you know, obviously the two twins, two Japanese twins, and the vampire chick were obviously uh, pretty much using them, like with with uh, the the with the Japanese twins' motive, Lily. Being for the reason why they trapped Alucard is because he refused to show them any more of his secrets. So they pretty much wanted to kill him so they can get to it themselves. Although Alucard was literally kind of giving them everything they needed. But I guess they need to know it now or they wanted it for themselves or they didn't trust Alucard. Like, it's that. Like, the logic is just, like, totally opaque in this season at times, especially with those two fucks. Uh, so, yeah, uh, pretty much that's got to say about it. I mean, at times it can be solid. At times it can be a bit just a bit far out, so to speak, far-fetched and uh, not really comprehensible at times. But uh, most of all, I do think that overall dialogue and jargon is pretty much literally the most shining aspect of the show amongst anything else. It almost literally does at times the banter, not specifically with with, with uh, Sypha and Trevor, but with most characters in general, like the two uh, vampire lesbos. Pretty much it almost do feel really, it feels real. It feels, it feels like, you know, banter you could have with someone on a daily basis. It almost seems like as the voice actors themselves literally stop, like, you know, acting and just, you know, put a performance on as if, you know, they were actually having constructed, uh, you know, conversations with each other. So, yeah, that's pretty good. And with some banter, you get both, yes, exposition, but here again, you get more insight on, you know, more background characters, which is way more than what uh, Season 2 gave us, where... You just killed the other vampire kings. They were just simply fodder. Hell, some of them barely even spec, and we only really got a reference to one of them in the new season. Just only established that she was a badass, but not really, because she died so fucking easily in the second season. So there's that. Uh, but here it's a bit more established, like God, like God, uh, Godfrey, the. Uh, the more uh, Viking barbaric uh, vampire. We like we got like we get a level of dialogue and exposition just as we would from the from characters from here, uh, season three. So it actually seems like to put a lot of time on it. And I know this is an unpopular opinion, but personally I kinda think Saint Ger Saint Germain was literally kind of the most just really Honestly, unnecessary character. I mean, you know, he's a source, a time traveling sorceress and whatnot, and he kind of knew what the cult was going on to, and he kind of helped thwart it them along with with uh, Sypha and Trevor. But it just seemed like he was just there to more or less supply more comedic effect into the series uh, uh, from the way how his attitude and gesture was for the most part. So, yeah, there's that. Uh, so, pretty much, I'm going to have to give uh, Castlevania an exceptional. It's entertaining at times. It can get real at times. It can get funny and humorous at times. The jargon is there. The art is there. The score is there. And overall, it's just great. It's really, it's really immersive. And it really is one of those two shows that you really... That, that's made for a more laid back, you know, type of audience, audience. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying like, I'm, it's not a elitist thing or anything going on, but 
I'm saying pretty much anyone can enjoy it, especially anyone of, you know, more laid back, you know, gesture, because that's kind of the same uh, atmosphere the show kind of also uh, more or less disperses, aside from being Gothic and anti-religious and blah, blah, blah at times. It, could, it also has this really laid back and, 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 and even kind of relaxing tone to it, despite of, you know, the, the circumstances that's going on. So, yeah, it's, it's enjoyable. I mean, it's enjoyable. God damn it, man. What's going on with me, man? What's going on, man? Come on, focus. <laughs> yeah, it's one of them days, man. But, yeah, it's, it's that. So, yeah, that's what's going on. Uh, apparently, all my classes are online now. So, you know, time, you know, time zip lining and all that is pretty much time management is pretty much nothing now because I can literally just finish the semester by just posting work. That's literally what it is. So that explains, again, like I said in the beginning of this video, I have more time to actually, uh, I have more time to actually, uh, you know, do YouTube again for the most part. Um, latest news. Uh, the Mortal Kombat, uh, 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 Scorpion movie looks great, although I kind of think the whole, I think the whole uh, revealance, re reveal of uh, Quan Chi, to me, kind of spoils the movie, and uh, for the most part, I feel like it, the, with the trailers, even with the Red Brand one, they should have just left more or less Scorpion fighting and apparently killing Quan Chi, because... In literally one split second, we see Quan Chi with no arms, so it's a fur that he's horrifically killed. <laughs> that part should have been left out because it, in general, kind of spoils it. Like, we know it happens. We know Quan Chi set up uh, Scorpion, but I just feel like those split seconds in there where we see Scorpion utterly welling on him kind of just really, it, it really, uh, it really, uh, it spoils the tension that's going to happen for the most part, especially when they show Goro pretty much beating Liu Kang's ass. Like, yeah, we know he's not going to die, people. But, yeah, I just feel like, I mean, it looks great. Like, in terms of the art, it looks like a lot of uh, the art, the overall art style and choices they use for uh, this upcoming Mortal Kombat movie. It, it, it bears a lot of uh, resemblance to... Uh, more or less uh, older, mid-90s uh, cartoons like G.I. Joe Extreme, uh, the original <laughs> Mortal Kombat uh, cartoon, Defenders of the, of the, of the Realm. It kind of even looks like X-Men. In uh, uh, Ultimate Spot, Ultimate, Spider-Man Unlimited. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, not to get confused. I mean, they're both ass, but one is less ass than the other one. And... It's especially well, even more well drawn than the other one. Yeah, it, lo it looks like a lot of uh, made uh, the Mortal Kombat trailer. It looks like how it's drawn, the art style, the shadow, the shadows you use, the darkening, the tints, the inking, and whatnot. The the choice, the art style, the choices they use. It looks very similar. It looks really reminiscent to uh, to uh, mid '90s cartoons like such. And I feel like that's a good call back to more or less people who came up in the 90s and just a call back to the franchise period because Mortal Kombat more or less was like the talk of the town in the 90s. And I feel like the art style they used, it was a good callback and a good uh, uh, pet to, uh, nostalgia for the most part. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much my thoughts on the upcoming movie. Uh, pretty much Patrick, Patrick Seitz pretty much reprised his role as Scorpion. Uh, because the whole time, like, I heard of a Mortal Kombat animated movie coming out. I didn't see the trailer. Uh, my friend told me that, like, you know, that was coming out. And considering, you know, Mortal Kombat is WB property now, uh, uh, my first instance, uh, I thought it was going to look like, uh, you know, the DC animated movies, like uh, Throne of, Atl of, uh, of Atlantis or... Batman Hush, or, you know, I thought it was going to look like that, like this really Legend of Korra looking, because it's obviously probably made by the same studio, drawn and animated by the same studio, 
this really Legend of Korra looking design to it, but they did a 180 and did a more 